All right, welcome. Thank you for joining us. It's good to see a crowd here. We're looking forward to sharing with you how our customers in the in the life sciences industry, as well as other healthcare related industries, are using decisions to realize leaps in productivity and change the way they deliver services to their customers, whether those customers are internal or external. Uh, I'm Chris Bug. I'm joined by my colleague and, and someone whom I call a friend, Bracey Parr. Now, Bracey, he embodies the value of low-code, no-code platforms like Decisions. I like to say the only language that Bracey is proficient in beyond English is Spanish. A fun fact about Bracey, he went to college in Spain. Uh, so while you won't catch him slinging C-sharp, Java, or COBOL, you'll get a taste of how a no-code platform puts a lot of application development power in the hands of someone who is more of a life sciences domain expert than a software engineer. And, and that is the reason a lot of our customers are, are adopting this low-code, no-code approach to developing applications. Here's a bit of what we're going to cover today, but first I'd like to, if it's okay, set a couple of goals for you all. If you're already a decisions user, we hope you we hope we can inspire you to explore some new use cases for how you might use decisions in your business. Um, again, if you're already a decisions user, we, we'd love for you to learn a couple of new techniques. Uh, for example, you may be workflow oriented with whatever applications you're developing in decisions, uh, but we'll show you some techniques for leveraging the decisions rules engine and data handling methods to perform master data management and extract, extract, transform, load, ETL operations and functions. Now, if you're one of those who's not very familiar with decisions, or you may not even be all that familiar with low code and no code uh, software development platforms, we hope you'll walk away uh, with the conclusion that platforms like decisions, uh, among other platforms, can help you uh, quickly deploy custom automations and applications that would have taken you 10 times the effort to develop the traditional way from code. Uh, if you reach that conclusion and a, and a use case uh, comes to mind that you'd like to explore, please do reach out to me or, or to Bracey, and you can do that via the chat function uh, right here or via email afterwards. Um, in terms of the agenda, I won't belabor the who we are part. I'm guessing you guys are here to see technology and solutions, not corporate bios, but I'll provide you some context for why customers are using platforms like Decisions. And then we'll jump into the tool, and Bracey will demonstrate some functions that are particularly relevant to those uh, working in the life sciences realm. Uh, if finally, we will save some time for a question and answer, but you don't have to wait for that to ask your questions. Feel free to use that Q&A function in Zoom, or, or you can use the chat function as well if you're more familiar with that to submit questions at any time, and we'll, we'll seek to answer them as they come in. All right, let me give you a little bit of background on decisions. Uh, decisions is 100% dedicated to a single product. Uh, which is the Decisions Business Process Automation Platform. It's a rules-driven, no-code approach to developing applications to automate just about any operation. Uh, we develop that product. We have pro a professional services team that does nothing other than implement that product. And we have a support team that exclusively supports that product. Uh, we're headquartered here in sunny Virginia Beach. Not so sunny today, but... Uh, we have a global operations center in Hyderabad, India, and we've got over 200 employees. We've got dozens of partners implementing and supporting our platform, and we're proud of every single one of our customers and now count over 275 of them around the world. And you may recognize some of them featured at the bottom of the screen. About 25% of our customer base is in the healthcare and life sciences sector. A little bit about why our customers are using decisions. Um, particularly in life sciences. In, in no industry does human error have greater consequences or do rising costs receive greater scrutiny than in healthcare and life sciences. Our customers are using decisions to eliminate life or death mistakes, uh, ensure regulatory compliance, and, and reduce weight, waste. And a lot of our customers were not totally familiar with the concept of no code. So if it's okay, I'll start there. In this case, we're gonna take a look at what we call a business rule. Now, what you see here are two different representations of the same business logic. Now, what you see on the right is a relatively intuitive business rule for determining the correct dosage of different meds given a patient's weight. Now, you can see how it's fairly understandable to a layperson, a business user, or even a, an analyst. And, and what you see on the left is that same logic contained in the rule on the right, except this time is rendered in C-sharp code. 
The whole idea of no code is to speed up the pace at which you can build custom applications and ease maintenance of those applications. And the code on the left, it took about two to three hours for a C-sharp developer to, to think through and write out. And honestly, that didn't even include testing and debug. The business rule on the right took about 15 minutes to build, and that included testing and debug to make sure it was producing the behavior intended by the drafter. So that's about 75 to 95 percent faster. And when, when you decide to add a new medication or change a dosage, you can see how much more quickly a clinical expert can update that rule on the right than would be possible by working with the developer to do so with that code on the left. Hence the whole, the whole push for, for no code or low code software development. I'm going to briefly cover some uh, specific nomenclature we'll use during the demo today. Decisions has five groups of features, and they're all highly integrated within the decisions platform. We have a rules engine. You saw an example of a business rule. We've got a workflow manager, uh, but the functions of the workflow manager go well beyond uh, you know, assigning tasks to people and tracking them to completion. It also incl includes what I like to refer to as data flow elements, which can be really important uh, when coupled with the rules engine for master data management and other ETL operations that are so common in the life sciences industry. Um, we've got mining agents. I won't go very far into that today. Uh, we have a rich integration layer featuring a very open API. Uh, for those of you that are like me and can't spell API, this just simply means that we can generally integrate with any of your other modern applications and data sources, again, without having to resort to writing any code. Finally, we have an interface designer that allows you to develop user-facing elements, again, without the need for any code. Uh, let's talk about how people get work done with no code. Uh, we see three broad automation patterns with decisions, and they range from the rules engine and decisioning to full-blown custom applications. Uh, these automation patterns are not specific to decisions. In fact, they are germane to custom software development in general, and a lot of other platforms support a subset of these patterns without the need for code, or, and then other platforms uh, support all of them, but with the requirement for code. Um, decisions is the only automation platform that allows users to fully invoke all three of these broad automation patterns without the need for any code at all. Our customers in healthcare and life sciences utilize all three of our key automation patterns that we see across our entire customer base. Um, many of our customers are using decisions as a rules engine. Many of these implementations of our rules engine are what we would call headless. That is, they operate primarily without any user input or user interface. Uh, the rules engine is a place to centralize business logic and expose this logic to business users so that they can edit and maintain it using our graphical design tools. This gets that logic out of stored procedures and SQL databases, web pages, or other custom code, and it puts it in, the, in an accessible location that can be easily changed and maintained without diving into arcane code. Roche Genentech is a great example of a customer leveraging our rules engine in the life sciences sector. Uh, Genentech may run dozens of clinical trials at any given time. Each one of those trials may utilize dozens of labs geographically dispersed to collect patient samples. Unfortunately for Roche Genentech, those labs don't all report data in the same format. So Genentech uses our flow engine to ingest sample data and then uses the rules engine to extract a lineage from thousands of samples that come from hundreds of labs in order to store that granular sample related data in some sort of a unified clinical data model. So think of that as just simply cleaning dirty data. And once they have this heterogeneous sample data in a unified clinical data model, now they can go off and execute additional patientless studies and all sorts of trials to make new discoveries that enhance or even save lives. The rules engine in the decisions platform, it's enterprise class. It can run thousands of transactions a second. At the same time, it is highly accessible to non-developers and it enables clinical data analysts and other users to participate in solution development and solution maintenance. And this increases the velocity, which in this case, Roche can onboard new labs and clinical trials into the solution. A second automation pattern we see out there is orchestration and integration. Uh, it's a key automation pattern that's equally important to our customers in healthcare and life sciences. Data has many origins. It requires multiple integrations. Moreover, knowledge work may need to touch multiple systems, systems that don't always have a native integration with one another, but all of which can integrate with an orchestrator like decisions without the need for code. Revenue cycle management is a critical function for many healthcare organizations, especially payers. 
and providers. Uh, revenue cycle management inevitably touches EMRs, ERPs, billing, billing systems, and CRMs, and decisions can orchestrate custom workflows that need to interface with all of these. Uh, decisions also includes a fully integrated workflow engine. Our workflow engine allows you to develop end-to-end -end application, applications that include the generation of tasks and assignments to different people or functions in your organizations, including critical assignments that need to be reliably tracked to resolution. This is common in clinical settings where you may have an application that has a patient-facing element, a provider-facing element, and may include assignments and tasks for uh, different personnel with the provider, as well as payer-facing elements for uh, revenue cycle management functions. Here are some of the type of people and organizations in the healthcare and life sciences space who are using decisions. Obviously, we've talked about how pharma is using decisions. Clinical trial managers, both in pharma and in uh, clinical research organizations, are using decisions. We've got payers who are serving uh, in, in those who are serving payers, particularly, particularly in the revenue cycle management space who are using decisions. Clinicians are using applications to, uh, built on decisions. And finally, the fast growing healthcare tech space. Companies are building their SaaS offering on, uh, on decisions and decisions is enabling these companies to develop their product more rapidly at a lower uh, software development costs and simplifying the maintenance and enhancement of those offerings so they can keep up with changes in market needs and market conditions. Decisions does come with a long list of pre-built common integrations to applications like Salesforce, DocuSign, Microsoft Dynamics, and SharePoint, among some others. We support SAML compliant identity, identity management. We integrate with Active Directory. Uh, additionally, you can connect to all major database vendors, including Oracle, Postgres, as well as some of the open source uh, databases like MySQL and even NoSQL. We also fit nicely into a microservices architecture. So in, in addition to being able to connect with all these uh, other systems, every rule, workflow, and report can be called by these other systems externally through a REST service, and uh, th which make, means decisions is equally adept at making these calls to external services as well. We'll be showing, we may be showing you uh, an example of a call in a few minutes. Let's discuss for a second how our uh, customers and prospective customers typically differentiate between different platforms in this space, because it is a crowded space. Uh, from a corporate standpoint, a lot of customers want to know that their partner has experience with complex enterprise level implementations. Uh, for example, until you've migrated 8,000 business rules from a legacy rules engine to a modern no-code rules engine, you don't have the tooling and talent fully in place to do so. Uh, capacity to deliver professional services and support of projects with significant scope and to provide around the clock support is important to some of our customers, while others, they may be able to live with more limited support. Now, shifting from these corporate differentiator to uh, differentiators to some of our more product specific features, we do have eight different rules editors. This allows our customers a lot of flexibility uh, with how they decide to render complex logic. Now, what makes us fundamentally different from the other rules engines is that our rules engine is fully integrated with a workflow engine and an orchestration engine. It's not always as simple as calling a rule. Sometimes you need to call data from multiple sources and systems, perform some sort of function on it to make sure it conforms to whatever standard is required before it's introduced into that uh, rule. And a rules engine that, that is combined with an orchestration and flow engine allows you to do all of that without any code. Otherwise, you'll find yourself writing a lot of code around your no-code your no code rules engine. Now, some low-code, no-code platforms include features uh, such as native support for healthcare-related data standards, such as FHIR and HL7, and we'll show you uh, how we do that. Uh, you'll also want to decide which features are required to maintain HIPAA requirements. This may even include uh, a platform that you have the ability to deploy on-prem rather than relying on the security of a third-party managed cloud or you may wanna make sure that that third-party managed cloud is, is certified or evaluated against uh, HIPAA standards. Finally, while some larger organizations might be able to adopt a, or have the luxury of a best of breed approach so that each narrow application development niche can have its own supporting tool set, uh, organizations in the mid-market, they generally, we see them seeking a more well-rounded platform that frees them from the considerable costs of supporting a more expansive toolkit. Here's some additional use cases we've seen our healthcare customers employ. We have many that are streamlining infectious disease reporting. 
We've got some who are using AI to improve patient outcomes. Uh, several are leveraging the Internet of Things to drive a provider and patient actions, and we'll show you an example today of how they do that. We've got customers who are remitting pharmacy orders. They're doing that in a secure way so they can maintain a full audit trail. We have customers who are assisting uh, physicians and nurses with selecting treatment paths. And, and finally, we have uh, many providers who are using our platform to orchestrate patient referral rules and workflows. And I'm going to give you just a bit of context before I hand it off to Bracey. In a moment when I hand it off, you're going to see us transition between two logical divisions in our platform. We have the designer studio and the end user portal. We're actually going to spend most of our time today in the designer studio, but let me touch on that end user portal first. The end user portal is quite simply where your customers interface with the applications that are built in decisions and where your business users go to get that work done. The end user portal allows you to quickly build out dashboards that include pre-built report elements, process audit trail elements, and other visual elements. And reports, these reports might include reports of assignments for a particular user or group that may sit in some sort of a work queue. Now, we don't force the end user portal upon you. Many of our customers run decisions headlessly, which allows you to use your existing user experiences and UIs built in other technologies while allowing decisions to handle all that backend processing. Now, we also like to say decisions can meet you wherever you like to get your work done. If you don't want a business user to have to enter uh, decisions to, or log into anything to complete or assi an assignment or task, you can simply use decisions to generate prompts such as an SMS or an email to a user uh, who can then execute an approval or other task right from his or her inbox. Now the designer studio. This is where developers who use decisions, designers, to wireframe their business process and ultimately build complex functional applications uh, without any code. And, and you'll have a chance to note how Bracey is able to seamlessly move between designers. When he's architecting a process, you'll see him in a flow designer. And when that process incorporates a, a, some sort of business logic, you'll see him seamlessly enter a rules designer. And he'll do that without having to switch to a different application altogether to start building rules. Likewise, when that process requires a user interface or data entry, you'll see how he seamlessly transitions in and out of a forms designer, again, all without the same, uh, all within the same integrated application. If you want to build all your UI and rule elements uh, completely separately, you can, but our design experience doesn't force that upon you. And that enhances the ability for business SMEs, uh, subject matter experts to collaborate with developers, re resulting in applications that are built quickly built right the first time and without extensive rework between sprints. And now, without further ado, I will hand it off to Bracey. Thank you, Chris. So in our first demo, we're going to do a build from scratch that simulates how providers and clinicians are utilizing decisions to build out an app completely based on decisions, no code uh, paradigm. Then we'll talk about a payer perspective and bring in insurance, rule sets, and how payers are leveraging no code to automate their business. And then lastly, we'll step back and take more of a wider technical perspective um, and discuss some of the modules that Decisions have, has that make it easy for med tech and life science companies to be able to use Decisions to increase the speed of development. Uh, in this initial build from scratch, we're starting out here in the Decision Studio. And as Chris mentioned, we have a variety of different rule types that depending on the kind of rule you're trying to construct, uh, fit different scenarios. Now, we're going to be simulating what a group of doctors is doing using decisions to formulate recommendations for wellness daily for their patients where they receive based off of data that they gather from different internet of things or IOT wearables. For instance, you watching the webinar, you may have an Apple watch, uh, you may have an IOT connected body scale uh, or a food scale. I've even seen things like exercise bands that now you can connect to the internet. All of these data feeds can go into a rules engine built in decisions and it can come out with recommendations for what you should do, say, if you didn't get the right number of steps in for exercise, or your heart rate was high for the day, or maybe you didn't get enough sleep. 
uh, you could easily see how this extends to other more technical devices that are in use at hospitals like IV drips, insulin pumps, pacemakers, and all sorts of other med devices. Uh, now, just a quick word before we start building these rules. This is definitely not to replace practitioners in any way, shape, or form. This is simply augmenting their ability to be able to service more patients um, and in a long view, uh, lower cost um, and help fix uh, some of the issues that we're currently experiencing, especially in the US health market. Um, and again, it really illustrates the collaboration that no code provides between the subject matter experts like doctors, nurses, other practitioners, um, and those who create software. So we'll jump right in, and we're going to start off with a truth table, and we're going to look at the number of steps a patient has taken in a day, and also look at the hours of sleep that they may have gotten. So I'm going to go ahead and create this flow, pardon this rule here, and in all of decisions designers, you're across the top, you're going to have actions like save, checkpoint, undo, redo, and we'll actually come up here later with debug so we can test these rules before we uh, utilize them in another context. Decisions is meant to allow less technical users to participate in the process. And because of that, it has lots of different guardrails. So for instance, here, we see a warning that we need to set up our input data. If you already had a database you were connected to, maybe some data structures that you had registered in decisions, a CSV file, um, an API that you had, or webhook that you had um, hit and you already had the data, uh, you wouldn't necessarily take this step, that what you see me doing here, which is defining my inputs. Um, you would already have those available to you to pick from, uh, but given that we are starting from scratch, I'm just registering some inputs that then I can use when I build my rule. In the middle of the canvas here, you see a tabular format with light blue columns and a dark blue column. These light blue columns are my inputs. And so I can use various criteria to be able to say, what should I give as a health score, depending on how many steps a patient has walked and how many hours of sleep that they've gotten that day. Uh, you can see here we have this red exclamation mark. It's saying that my rule step is not selected. So the wizard will guide me through the construction of this first rule. And so we'll look first at the number of steps that they've taken. And in decisions, it's data aware. So we have number rules here rather than string rules or Boolean rules or other rules that relate to different kinds of data. Because I'm constrained to these rules, it helps prevent errors from being made in the first place. And so we'll just define a couple of, of segments here. Uh, we'll say maybe, you know, if they got between um, zero and 3,000 steps, uh, we'll, we'll have this as our first condition. I'm going to repeat this twice, actually because we're also going to be checking the number of hours of sleep that they got. So I clicked and I added a new column, and there really is no limit to the number of criteria that you can look at. So you can accommodate a, a thousands, hundreds of thousands of different combinations of factors when you're using these rules. And it's very much the same setup. We'll look at hours of sleep. I'll select my rule here. And then within each cell in the column, I'm able to define uh, what what that um, the criteria should be exactly. So why don't we say maybe if they've gotten between zero and five hours of sleep, we'll have this as our first echelon, then we'll go to maybe five to seven hours of sleep, or six to seven hours of sleep, excuse me, and we'll set up one more row here that has the same number of steps, and then we'll have a higher amount of sleep. Uh, why don't we do six to seven and we'll say, and of course you could cross this with additional values like uh, the age of the patient, uh, because obviously the amount of recommended sleep depends on the age. Uh, but just for simplicity's sake, we'll leave it here. And then for each of these levels, I'm going to output 
a health score that then I can use later. And so we'll define this as an output. And perhaps for this health score, uh, this is not very good. Not only have you not gotten an adequate number of steps representing exercise, but you've also been sleeping very poorly. And we can do something with that data later on. And then perhaps for this health score, uh, we give this a two. It's a little bit better. You're, you're, you're still not getting your number of steps, but you are getting more sleep. And then perhaps for this echelon, we, uh, we select three. Now I can go through and define more values. And so you'll see here, uh, if we get uh, perhaps this, this amount of steps, and we can also define that again. And as you iterate here, you'll be able to build very custom data depending on what the hours of sleep that you're looking at. So maybe we say, you know, if you get between zero and six, and then maybe for this rule, it's a little different. We'll just look and see if you got between seven and 10. We won't do three levels of sleep for this rule, just to illustrate how those things can vary. And then we'll say, if you got over 6,001 steps, that you're good to go. Maybe we won't actually even look at the amount of sleep. Uh, so we'll just do this ignore. Of course, I'm not a doctor, much to the chagrin of my parents. And so uh, these are really just made up uh, just to simulate what one of our customers is doing. And maybe we'll actually even put the health score here as four. Additionally, you can see at the bottom, we have this no match outcome. So we can define a default if one of these rules is not met. And how about we put this as maybe we'll leave it as a two. We'll go ahead and debug this rule to see what the outcome is. And when I click on debug, it brings me to a console where I can test my rule against single one-off tests or sample data that we would utilize. And so maybe for hours of sleep, let's say we got seven hours of sleep and we got uh, 4,000 steps. If we run this, you'll see that it doesn't match any of our rows. And so we add the outcome here as two. All right, so let's go back and do that again. And maybe we say our hours of sleep is eight. If I hit run here, you'll see that it is between seven and 10. And so we came out here with the health score of three. You could run as many tests as you needed to make sure that your rule was configured properly. And the best thing about this format of rule is it's very similar to Excel, which a lot of clinicians and a lot of subject matter experts are used to dealing with. And you're able to easily add additional columns if necessary, remove columns, update values within the cell as recommendations change, as new studies come out, and as new regulatory bodies uh, make different rules about um, you know, patient lifestyle. Hey, Bracey, we have a question. Um, sure. I notice how you use two columns in this tr truth table sure. to, um, to, to develop that rule. But, but the question is, could I have also used a rule set? Could I have turned that into two truth tables that maybe were simpler and then combine those into some sort of a rule set for, for scoring? Absolutely. You have the flexibility within decisions to either consolidate rules if it makes semantic sense um, and it matches your you know, business domain knowledge, uh, you can consolidate them within a single table like we've done here, or you could separate them out and then use them in a rule set and use some other scoring um, function to be able to weigh them later on. Okay. It's really up to, to the domain uh, expert there and decisions just gives you the tools. Great question, Chris, thank you. All right, next we're gonna create a different rule. This time we're gonna utilize our statement rule. And we're going to be looking at blood pressure. I'll hit create here. This rule, as you can notice across the top, has many of those same major actions, very similar to products like Microsoft Word, where you know exactly when you come into a designer where things will be located. And here, again, with that paradigm of assisting less technical users to be able to participate in the process, we've got more uh, guardrails, warnings here, uh, letting me know that this has no uh, 
conditions, and so it would always evaluate as true. And here we can, again, we can set up our input data. Of course, this would likely be already defined by your team. Um, so we'll say, you know, systolic pressure. Uh, we'll say systolic, and then we'll say diastolic. All right. And both of these, again, will be numbers. And so we'll be working with some number rules. For the statement rule, it's a bit different than the tabular style that we just saw. This is your typical if then else, where you look at conditions, you can combine them using and statements or or statements. And I can come down here to my drop down and I can make sure that my systolic blood pressure, when I hit next, uh, we'll say is less than maybe 130. There is no limit to the number of conditions you can have within a single rule. I've seen customers do you know, up to 40, 50, 60 conditions. Uh, but once you get to that level, a lot of times, and this goes to Chris's question, it's easier to use a more visual rule rather than trying to relate, okay, if it's this either or, do I need to go to this area or to another area? Um, so we're gonna keep this one simple just for, for time's sake. And we'll say the systolic pressure the pardon the diastolic pressure uh, will make sure that this is less than 100. Okay, these rules can return a simple true or false. Uh, they can direct a path two ways. They could actually kick off other actions, um, or they can output data. For instance, um, so we're going to have them output some data, um, and we'll just output that. Uh, perhaps a score again. We'll call it maybe the blood pressure score. Uh, again, we'll be using a lot of numerical data here. And we'll give that a, a one if it's true, and then a zero if it's false. I'd like to debug just one more time to show you how this might work. So the diastolic will say maybe is 80, and the systolic will say maybe is 110. I can hit debug here and you can see, which is very important for all of our medical customers, especially in terms of liability, the rules run and are fully tracked and audited. So you can do historical analysis, see what rule ran when, what was the state of the rule at runtime, and then you can compare it to possible future cases and then as well as past cases so you can refine your rules as best as possible. Um, you can see here that 110 is less than 130 and 80 is less than 100. So we came out with that blood pressure score of one versus zero. All right, uh, we're gonna build one more rule and then we'll actually put all of these together in a flow and take a look at our flow designer. Uh, this last rule is a matrix style rule. Um, and this is actually my favorite style of rule because it's very intuitive. You're looking at two things uh, crossing them with axes, almost similar to a Punnett square uh, for those of you who remember uh, high school biology. And so we're going to cross uh, the, well, the two wellness factors. And when I hit create, we brought in two, another canvas. Again, the knowledge that you would have gained at this point, you would already know where to locate your major actions. You know, you have your settings here over on the right-hand side. Uh, you can set up your input data. So we'll call this our you know, wellness score. Uh, it will be one that we look at. And then as well, we have our blood pressure score. Later on, I'll show how we can actually map from data structure to data structure. So if you are pulling data from disparate sources, you're able to use our visual mapping editor to map from property to property. We'll go ahead and start with our left axis here within our matrix rule. And when I click on add rule, we get all kinds of rules that relate to different types of data. Again, decisions is going to constrain me to use the correct data types so I don't code in errors already. And so we'll look at these number ranges and we'll call this, you know, our wellness factor, our wellness factor score. I'll hit add. And here I can set up number ranges. Um, so maybe we'll do, you know, if it's between um, we'll do our low value. If it's between zero and one, uh, we'll have this set up as a range. Perhaps if it's medium, you know, it's, it's uh, 
two to three, pardon three, and then maybe we'll do, oh, catch, catch myself there. And you see how easy it is to go back and correct mistakes that you might made while you're building. We'll do four to five. All right, so we'll have our high value. And the number that we'll be evaluating against this will be that wellness score that will come from one of our previous rules. And so you can see here, we're creating almost like a relay race where different data comes into different rules. Those rules then create data themselves. They find some sort of semantic meaning based on the domain knowledge. And then rules farther along can then consume that knowledge um, and make recommendations. All right, you can see here, we've got our ranges, including a not in range. So a lot of times the question comes up, what if the rule doesn't fit the case? Decisions always provides a default catch option to be able to alert you to that fact. Um, up here, we'll utilize a different number rule. We'll just say if it equals one. So we'll call this our blood pressure score. And we will just say, you know, is the value equal to one? Otherwise, we know that, it, that it's zero coming from that statement rule that we just built. All right, let's see what's going on with my outcome scenario here. It's letting me know, oh, we've got an extra one there. All right, took care of that, which is great to have those validation warnings to let you know something is awry. Things like that happen on live television, Bracey. <laughs> of course, all the time. All right, so for this one, we'll say, um, depending on whether or not they met both of these requirements, obviously, this is our best uh, patient case where their wellness factor score is high. They're exercising, they're sleeping, and their blood pressure is within the recommended range. This might be a message of encouragement to the patient. You know, great work, keep it up. All right, maybe they've they're in that echelon, but they, their blood pressure score is not right. Um, this might be something to say, you know, discuss, discuss blood pressure options with your doctor. And then of course we can come up with all sorts of other messages to be able to come and say, um, you know, you had a great blood pressure, uh, but get more sleep and exercise. Again, these messages are very trite, but these group of doctors that are implementing this within decisions, as well as another a client who's using decisions with IoT devices, uh, they're coming up with thousands of different recommendations that are very targeted based on hundreds of different aspects of those patients. Um, so we can say work on blood pressure and sleep and exercise. And then for the patients that are doing the worst, you know, maybe we say check in with your provider immediately uh, letting them know hey we need to we need to write this ship um, as as quickly as possible and perhaps even we can have the same message uh, depending on those different levels uh, if we don't meet something maybe we'll just throw an error and we'll do some sort of error handling uh, within the tool okay let's put all of these rules together um, so for that i'm going to create a flow Decisions is both a workflow engine as well as a rules engine. So you can utilize the flow engine to put these rules in a sequential order that makes sense, uh, massage any data that you need to. And we'll see more examples of that later on when we move into our payer demo. Uh, we'll call this, oh, I believe actually I may have something already made for this. Give me one sec. Ah, our healthcare outcome. All right. So I've already set up a, a flow with some inputs here. Again, you have those actions across the top when you move into the flow designer, but instead of options to be able to build rules, now you have around 3000 different steps that you can pull out from this steps toolbox and construct your process. So for instance, we built a truth table. So we'll pull this uh, step out. We also built a statement rule. I'll go ahead and pull this block out as well. And then lastly, we had that matrix rule, which I will also select as a step. Um, you've got all kinds of steps for integrations, dealing with data, dealing with HL7 and fire. 
which we'll see in a little while. And all of these really consist of code underneath the hood that you don't have to worry about. These steps just take in data and output data, and you're very um, and you're you're able to use these within the flow. I'll go ahead and connect the steps. And again, you see lots of validation warnings uh, letting us know that certain things are not set up. I'll go ahead and pick which rule I wanted to use. So we have step and hours of sleep. Uh, for my blood pressure rule, I'll go ahead and pick that blood pressure rule that we had. And this just shows how you're able to reutilize rules in different contexts as well. So these rules aren't simply one off. Uh, they could be used in many, many different contexts, many applications. And for a lot of our customers, they actually resell rules to various customers of theirs. And so this is one method in which you're able to, to do that. And then we'll cross our wellness factors. Okay. Um, so for our blood pressure uh, score, you see it's asking for two inputs here. I don't want to turn this into a training lesson, uh, but I do want to show our input mappings. A lot of times you'll have disparate data sources that call the same variable different things. Unlike traditional coding, Decisions does not punish you when that happens. You're able to use the mapper to actually come in and map. For instance, we called it diastolic pressure and systolic pressure. And then here on the rule, we called it diastolic you know, BP and BP. Um, so we can just simply drag and drop again in that visual paradigm and map those pieces of data. Lastly, for the matrix rule, we'll do the same thing. Uh, we called it, I forget what we, I forget what we called it necessarily. Oops, pardon me. Uh, for our rule. Now, Bryce, you couldn't you have navigated straight into that rule designer to see what you called it? Yes, uh, but you can see it right on oh, in the okay. flow as well. Yep. Yep. So we'll call this our wellness factor. Okay. Uh, the, we call the, it the wellness score. The default result was not um, was not descriptive enough for you for your <laughs> your stellar software development practices, Bracey. No, because one of the beauties of having decisions is it's actually self documenting. And so wow. you're able to eliminate a lot of technical debt if you rename these different steps um, as well as your different outputs. So somebody comes after you, they know exactly what you meant and, uh, and, and when you meant it within the process. Neat. All right. So we'll go ahead and debug this. We'll say something maybe, you know, diastolic pressure. We got eight hours of sleep. We got 4,000 steps. Um, and then our systolic pressure, maybe we'll do 110. All right, we'll go ahead and start debugging. And again, you can see that within the product, all of this has been tracked as it moves from rule to rule. And so we can go in and look and see that the health score was three. We can see that our blood pressure score was one. And if we look at our matrix rule, Looks like we have medium, but we need to get more sleep and exercise here. And this would be the message that would be displayed to the client in their app or on their uh, Apple Watch or, or, or digital watch device. And so this was just a quick and dirty uh, build from scratch. But you can see within just 15 minutes, uh, we have already accomplished quite a lot that then you could iterate on um, and really be able to rapidly develop an application like this. Um, next, we're gonna pivot to some to an to a application that involves um, some decisions uh, UI. Uh, this is a demo for prescriptions where we're looking to see if a patient is insured. And then if they are insured and it, the, the patient's insurance is not expired, we are going to recommend based on their medical condition, um, a specific dosage based on uh, recommendations from um, the CDC, FDA, all of these regulatory bodies. I have, um, a, I have a question from the crowd here, Bracey. Sure. They want to know if that interface you, you're showing right there was developed in decisions or, or a third party technology, no, like so React is, or something. No, so this is actually decisions own native UI. Um, and you'll see here in a second when we go into the back end, um, I'll show what the dashboard and the forms designers look like, very much like the flow. They're all just drag and drop. 
and what you see is what you get. I'm going to quickly pull up the data that we'll be utilizing. Uh, you can see here we've got an Excel file with all sorts of patients. Uh, none of this is actual data. This is just made up. Uh, we've got phone numbers, the medical conditions, are they insured, what is the insurance name, the expiration date, and we have a lot of customers who cross uh, reference all of the data that they receive from the different practitioners with the data that they have from the payers to be able to determine what needs to be paid and when. And you can imagine with all of the different healthcare networks across the United States, there's tons of different combinations of factors of saying when a person should or should not uh, receive you know, benefits for a specific, um, for, for a specific uh, treatment. And so we're gonna utilize this. Um, when I hit get started, we have a form that was built in decisions that allows us to ingest the CSV file. And so I'm gonna upload these sample medical records. Decisions will import the data, it'll parse the data, it'll run a series of rules, and then it will have an outcome that will show me who needs to receive what medicine and if they need to receive any such medicine. All right, so that all happened in a couple microseconds in the background, uh, but we'll go through it in, um, in, in the back end so you can truly understand what happened. Um, so you can see we pulled the patient's names or medical conditions, the uh, prescription that we recommended, if any, and then the dosage that they would require. Um, for those patients which did not have insurance um, or it's expired, we have some note here that lets us know within our audit trail why this patient did not receive, uh, say, the, the particular medication that they were seeking. If I come here to the back end of decisions and we take a look at this flow, again, we have some documentation that describes what this process does. Um, we have our form designer here, which I'll quickly go into. Just like the flow designer, we have our left-hand side toolbox where we can easily drag and drop different form controls onto a canvas to be able to let them upload documents and data. Decisions can handle things like CSV, Excel, XML, data from message queues, JSON, uh, XSD, really any kind of data in whatever format, wherever it lives, decisions can reach out, connect to it, massage it, into the right format and run it through the rules. Uh, decisions is almost like a complete package in that regard and sets us apart from other rule engines, which actually require a lot of upfront work in a different tool. Um, so you're, there's a lot of value add in having something like this, uh, this flow designer in conjunction with your rule designer. Uh, here you see an example of the deserialization of the medical records where we're massaging the data. And then we go ahead and run these evaluations. Now, Chris alluded to a rule set a little bit earlier on. That's another way of designing rules where you can combine rules of different types into an order precedent that you set. And so we, for example, can look and see if the patient is insured. If not, we can have some sort of data that's, that comes out that says that they're not, um, maybe their insurance is expired we're looking to see if the expiration date is greater than or equal to the current date. If it's less than or equal to the current date, then we know it's, uh, it's expired and we cannot cover that medicine. Uh, once we run through that rule set, we check to see if there's an, any exclusions that may have come out. And then we determine the medications. I won't show this for the sake of time. Um, and then we determine their dosage. And this is the rule that Chris presented at the beginning of the presentation, where we took this and it had an, a, an engineer who actually can sling uh, Java and C Sharp actually go and create this. This in decisions took maybe 10 minutes. In code, took hours and is much more brittle and hard to change. And of course, expensive using those heavy technical resources. In this, we have lots of different uh, providers who have nurses who have been trained in decisions and are able to come and make changes here, uh, depending on you know, the recommendations for the body weight. Uh, once we go through uh, these rules, we then return back to the parent flow. 
and then we show the results form, which you saw there at the end. Uh, we have about just seven minutes left, and so I'm going to cut our last uh, demo a little bit to save time for Q&A, because I can see the questions rolling in. Um, one really positive benefit of using decisions, um, it, it, sort of to expand on that data wrangling piece that I, that I spoke of earlier, um, is the inclusion of an HL7 and FHIR module. HL7 is a health reporting standard that's used all over the world. And currently we have clients utilizing this in a lot of different contexts, uh, but none that was so salient as during the pandemic when there were laboratories all over the US that had to report COVID results to different states. And as you can imagine, every state health department has their own regulations. And so they were very desperate to get this, uh, these formatting uh, from a very manual process of having people pour over spreadsheets and correcting things uh, to something that was automated that from a daily feed, they could just send the reports via HL7 in these flat files uh, to the different health departments. And that company with the help of decisions has now expanded to health reporting on three different continents, um, countries like Saudi Arabia and countries like Australia, which each have their own versions of HL7. Um, so for instance, I wanted to just show some of these, uh, these rules here, which you can see uh, we have different specimen types coming from uh, the, the laboratory that they're reporting. And we have the format that a specific health department might want. Um, so you see on the left-hand side, for instance, we have certain facilities that might just report that that COVID test was an anterior nasal. I hope everyone um, who's had a COVID test just had a, a, a bit of a moment where you remember that COVID test. Uh, the anterior nasal is when they stuck it up the back of your nostril. Um, yeah, Chris, yeah, right. Um, but that has to be reported. Of course, um, if you were lucky to be able to do serum or nasal swab, it was a little less traumatic for you. But all of these different health departments want this reported in a specific standardized format uh, that you can see here. Now, again, creating this in code, creating this in some other format than decisions would take ages. But with decisions, they were able to quickly make um, large rules. And as different states were onboarded and different countries are onboarded, it's very easy to come in and add additional rows, test them, and then deploy them to production. Um, and lastly, I'll just show, for instance, uh, ethnicity was one that depended on the ordering state. Uh, different states recognize different ethnicities and want them formatted in different ways. And so you can see, depending on the ordering state and the ethnicity, we had to standardize it in a specific format. Uh, the last thing I'll show here, just to just to um, round it all out, is within our decisions toolbox. We're back in the flow designer here. We have a whole HL7 manipulation module where you can do all sorts of things again with no code in decisions. And so, for instance, just to show you what this looks like, uh, this is an example you can see on my screen of a of a HL7 message. Um, I've obfuscated some of the, the data in it, so you can't tell the, the PII, um, but it's got different pipe delineations. If you're not familiar with HL7, this looks crazy to you, but maybe your organization may have to uh, use this in the future. With decisions products, with decisions product, you're able to break this message down into really digestible components and be able to clean up different segments. Um, each one of these segments, for instance, means something. Um, and we actually have other webinars on HL7 and FHIR that I encourage you to go watch if you're interested in this. Um, and, and you um, feel free to ask us questions. I'm, I'm sort of the resident HL7 expert here um, at Decisions. I'm so happy to take questions in, in regards to that. Um, we just have a couple minutes left. I want to be respectful of people's time. Uh, I think we can go over for, for questions, but Chris, I'd like to turn it back over to you and see what we've, um, what we've got. Yeah, and let me, uh, I'll, I'll get a thank you slide up here so people have our, our contact information. Um, I, I did receive a question about, hey, will we make this webinar available? And, and we will, 
um, because you're a, an, an attendee, it, we can make it available live to you uh, more immediately. Um, for those that weren't here, I think it may be gated content. So if you would like a, a copy of the recording, um, we'll be sure to get that out to you as quickly as possible. You can uh, email us or, um, or, or use the chat function here and we'll do that. Um, another question that came in, Bracey, is, is decisions RPA, robotic process automation? That is a, a great question, Chris. RPA really automates human behaviors, and it's very focused on screen recordings between systems that might not have open APIs, whereas decisions is BPA, or business process automation. We more or less rely on integrations, integrations with other systems, with other data, uh, where you remove the brittleness of the screen recording, um, because those are very dependent on the screen resolution, the the application staying the same um, and RPA does have some app, you know, applications, positive applications, but uh, BPA is a much wider and richer tool set than RPA. Uh, even though we do have customers that are using our tool in conjunction with tools like UiPath and, um, and Blue Prism, for instance. Yeah, and, and, and I have a little personal experience with that. We might use RPA. Uh, it, it, if there isn't an API there and you literally need to interface with a screen for, for an atomic um, uh, task uh, that, that you, there's no other way than to mimic human behavior, we'll plug into an RPA and RPA will grab that piece of data, deliver it to decisions via an API, um, and, and then decisions will go do the more complicated task uh, that, that happens to be using that piece of data. Exactly. Um, Another question I have is around encryption. Um, can it, does decisions feature encryption, and what does that look like, Bracey? I don't want to speak out of turn. Yes, we do, um, but it it really depends on your master data management policy. Uh, decisions does have steps to be able to encrypt um, information, but it all depends on where you'll be storing your data. Uh, most customers do not store their data within the decisions backend. Uh, database. And so likely that would just depend on your organization's policies. Okay. Um, another question here is how long does it take to, to go live? I, I think what they mean is, you know, how, how long does it take from when I start, you know, when I get decisions and I rip the, uh, the, the shrink wrap off that box and put the CD-ROM in my computer is that how it works? How long after that time do I go live with my my custom application? It really depends on the scope of the application you're building. Uh, we've had customers that have gone live in a matter of months, um, you know, two to three months, um, depending on the size of what you're building. And then we've had other customers who are building massive applications or an entire application from scratch built on decisions. And that can take, you know, six months to a year to be able to launch. Um, again, it, it depends on the requirements. And I'd like to add, I mean, I think some customers, they have um, a project that, that involves multiple technologies where 100% of that project doesn't sit within decisions. So a lot of times um, they, they may get done with it, building out their rules and, and their business logic and, and integrations and decisions much more quickly than they're able to um, complete the other tasks. Uh, with the other components of that project that might not might not include decisions. Um, I have another question about hosting options. What are the advantages of the customer hosting themselves versus um, leveraging decisions hosting? With decisions hosting, it's truly a SaaS offering where you don't have to worry about any of the IT setup, um, you know, it's, it's secure. You can host an AWS, Google, Cloud Platform, Azure. Um, and really, it's just a, you know, turnkey application. It also allows us as support to be able to go in and manage updates for you. Um, any sort of difficulties that you're having, it gives us a lot of access so we can provide the best level of support. Uh, some customers, though, do have very, very stringent security requirements, um, which we can achieve within our hosting 
uh, but it might be a bit more of, of a governance matter and step there. And they prefer to just host on prem um, and kind of bypass a lot of the, the lot of the regulatory burden. Makes sense. Um, another question related to one we talked about earlier. Um, could you have you showed those three rules in the build from scratch? One was a matrix rule, one was a statement rule, one was a truth table. Could you have combined all of that logic instead of having three? Could you have combined all of that logic in one truth table or rule table or something like that? Is that possible? Absolutely. So we could have built out an entire massive uh, truth table. I say massive loosely. It likely would have been uh, maybe four columns and maybe 15 or so rows. Um, and so if you did want to reduce that to one rule, uh, you're absolutely able to. I mean, I suppose in theory you could build everything with nothing but statement rules, but that would be the uh, correct the 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 no code equivalent of spaghetti code. Very much so. You'd have so many different places to go to make updates. Um, you would kind you you be wouldn't be taking full it. yeah full advantage of the, of the way to reduce tech debt um, with the more visual style of rules. Okay. I mean, those are all the, the questions I see. Um, we, we thank you all for attending. Again, uh, if, if you have um, a use case or would like to explore more how we might tackle something that you're interested in tackling, do uh, contact us. 